Good morning to you. Mark Zoddoth Hurricane Track here Thursday now, the 31st of July, 2025. I am in Tucson, Arizona. Why might I be here? I'll talk about that at the end of today's update. But first, some very interesting things have happened during the month of July that should set the stage for potentially a much busier August, especially as we get through probably the last third of the upcoming month. We'll take a look at that. A very active Pacific still and a few other odds and ends here and there. All right. Thanks for uh, tuning in. Let's get started, shall we? First, the interactive tracking map off the Hurricane Track Insider site. This is newly formed at Tropical Storm Gill out in the eastern Pacific. It is forecast to make its way into the vicinity of the central Pacific out here, uh, well east of Hawaii, should start to dissipate. So look, I know you just went through the scare from the tsunami out this way. This is not going to be a worry at all. So just, even though it's heading that general direction, don't worry about it. Forget it. If you're traveling to Hawaii, maybe your trip got interrupted from the tsunami shenanigans, uh, this won't bother you at all. So pay no attention to it. Just point it out because there are shipping interests out here and it's on the map, so we do have to talk about it. This is old Iona out here, dying away slowly uh, over the Central Pacific as well. Now, let's get into some really interesting stuff. This is from our good friend Michael Lowry, and oftentimes you hear me talk about the whole dry air, the Saharan air layer versus dust argument, and this really helps to drive my point home that it's not the dust that's choking off tropical development. It's the Saharan air layer, even though there can be dust out in the tropics. But let's read this. And of course, Mr. Lowry here is absolutely sensational at creating these amazing infographics and maps and all kinds of stuff. And being a map guy, a geographer, that really, uh, I like that, right? It, it scratches the itch, as they say. So what's Mr. Lowry saying? Well, the Saharan dust coverage across the tropical Atlantic this July the month, he says, when dust typically hits its yearly apex, you know, the highest, has been the lowest on record, not only that, but by a wide margin. A curious start to the season that I discuss in today's newsletter, this is a day or two ago, I'll put a uh, link to this in today's video description, all right? So this is important because the lack of dust I mean, look, this is the average. This is this orangish line right here. Where we are here, we are well below uh, the spread, all of it. You know, if you know statistics, we're down there, right? We're in the bottom range by a wide margin. And that is interesting because we've had a lot of dry air, a few dust outbreaks. We've been able to see those plumes come out. But nothing substantial and, in fact, has been record low. So why the dearth or lack of activity in the Atlantic? Well, it's because of the Saharan air layer and the very dry air out here. This is another way to look at it. The anomalies, uh, what we call the aerosol optical depth anomalies, another fancy way of saying dust, it has been on the low side, negative anomalies out here. So again, you have to say, well, then why haven't we had much activity in the Atlantic? The main development region's warm. We're going to have a bunch of cold anomalies and the sea surface temperatures in the Atlantic. What's the deal? It is the stable atmosphere, the warm over warm, but not the dust. So this should settle that, pun intended, you know how dust settles. This should settle that argument. It's not an argument. I'm trying to educate people. I want people to know, you know, what happens out here. And I learn stuff along the way as well. And when I do learn these things, I want to pass it along to you. So here you go. It's not the dust necessarily it's the dry air and there's been plenty of that now let's move along to our other good friend on the internet here ben knoll this is really interesting as well the central equatorial pacific has been cooling due to strong trade winds reaching its most unusually cool point since february meanwhile water in the main development region for the hurricanes uh, in the Atlantic here. Let's click on the map. Enlarge it. Um, this is the 12th warmest on record. These temperatures we're seeing, I'll highlight it in uh, this yellow color here. This is the 12th warmest we've ever seen it. So top 12, you know, that's not, not nothing. 
And then we are getting back closer to this La Nina look here in the tropical Pacific. So all of that should start to set the stage for this. And he posted this just minutes before I was getting ready to start recording today's video. Coincident with the lack of dust, the switch over to a cooler Pacific, the warming of the Atlantic, we get this. Large scale conditions look quite conducive toward increasing risk. And that's the important thing here. Increasing risk is not the same as it's going to happen. You understand it's an increasing risk for tropical storms and hurricanes during mid to late August. Aligning, this is also important, with the climatological increase in that risk. So we normally see the ramping up as we get towards the last third of August usually. And it looks like this year this convective pulse is forecast to move across the Atlantic, Africa, and into the Indian Ocean. We call that, you know it, the MJO, the Madden-Julian Oscillation. Trying to draw it in here for you. There you go. Not bad. So you can see that represented in this green color. This is the upward motion that we see. That's the convective pulse, the brown color, whatever. That's your sinking, large-scale subsidence. So it looks like, and we're going to have to wait and see if the if everything responds to it, that these puzzle pieces are going to start to fit in such a manner that as we progress through August, things should start to look more and more active, which is naturally what we would see. So there's no alarm bells here. There's no reason to get upset about it. It's just a natural progression towards what we thought would happen as we start to erode away this dry air, more moisture in the atmosphere, more forcing that this will allow. That green helps forcing where you get thunderstorm development. You have to have all that. You can have the warmest ocean ever. And if you don't have forcing and there's too much dry air around, you're not getting hurricanes. All right? So what does it look like? Well, these are the uh, maps that I've been showing you for years and years. This is the uh, NOAA Coral Reef map is what the current brand name for it is, I guess you could say. And yes, the main development region has warmed up quite a bit. Subtropics are still also very warm. So the whole of the Atlantic here, warmer than average, and by a pretty good margin in some areas, right? The Gulf, the Caribbean, especially the Northwest Caribbean, well above the long-term average as well. Then you've got this cooling of the Nino 3.4 region in the equatorial Pacific, and that is interesting too. We're going to look at a graph from Levi's site in just a moment. Let's zoom in, though, at these anomalies. That's a curious little ribbon of slightly cooler anomalies. And then it comes in here and then eventually ends up to the Florida Straits. And I'm assuming that the flow of water is this way. That would, I mean, I remember that from school. Uh, if it's going the other way, we got trouble. But it's interesting, this is a slightly cooler ribbon uh, of water, cooler water. The ribbon's cool, but the, the water's cool as well, right? You know, these high res or higher resolution maps, you can see this kind of stuff, these gradients show up quite well. Now there's a little area here in the Central Caribbean where it's slightly cooler than everywhere, everywhere else, but you see the only blues right here off the Yucatan, that's your upwelling that happens, so that's explainable. Everything else is warmer than average, so there's more heat content sitting out here for tropical systems to tap into that could make them more intense and it could give us more rainfall. Now back to this just for a moment, drawing your attention to this area again, the Nino 3.4 region as we call it, of the equatorial Pacific. And if you look at it on a graph, this is from Dr. Levi Cowan's Tropical Tidbits, we are at negative 0.488. So we can round that and call it 0.5 below average. We'll do a negative, see there's the average right there, and we are below it. So we're almost officially, at least on the graph here, in La Nina, weak La Nina territory. And that's interesting because we're almost to August. And all of these other tabs I showed you really start to matter. So what's happening out there today? Let's take a look. Pop back on here. Um, this also helps me to prove the point again about dry air versus dust. We'll sh I'll show you in a minute. First, though, uh, let's use a color that pops better. We'll use yellow. There's gill sitting out here, a few other areas of convective activity south and west of Central America, but that's about it. Gulf, Caribbean, nice and clear, but look at this thing right here. Curled up, 
Let's switch the vantage point over to the east just a little bit from this next tab. This, my friends, is exactly what I'm talking about. That's a well-defined tropical wave. You can see it's turning clear as day. I don't have to make it up and embellish it. It's turning. And if, if we didn't have the dry air layer sitting in there, this would have a lot more thunderstorms with it, and it might even be a tropical cyclone at this point, a depression, a storm, or whatever. But the dry air that is so prevalent out here is really keeping things in check. There's really not much dust out here right now, as we can see in the satellite animation. You would see that dust blowing off of Africa. There's a little bit sitting out here, but not much right here. The Saharan air layer is what is so important. That is the big point, biggest point, I think, of today's update, is understanding these vast, large-scale weather phenomenon, and it is the Saharan air layer that's really been dominating uh, and then an overall dry background state, too. Just the instability hasn't been there to begin with. Now, this is interesting. I'm not going to show you, you know, like one model run today, GFS, Euro, whatever. It's really not necessary because there's not much in the near term. However, people that track this kind of stuff, our good friend down in Miami, Adrian, uh, Long Range GEFS, that's the Ensemble Forecast System from the GFS, looking pretty active, hinting at a ramp up across the Atlantic Basin as we head toward mid-August. Peak Cape Verde season is coming. So this shows us the, you know, kind of like all the ensembles put together and what they would show with low pressure areas. And you get the idea, no, that's not a whole bunch of hurricanes coming. These are individual members of the ensemble group. Uh, I've said it many, maybe you're brand new. And you, what is talking about ensembles? Think about the conductor of an orchestra being the operational, and then all the members of the orchestra being these different members here, and then you get the big picture, or in the case of an orchestra, the full sound, right? And so lots more ensemble members of the GFS global forecast model, the numeric model, more of the ensemble members, the individual members, are developing tropical systems, cyclones, as we move through time. So that's something we'll be watching for. I think the stage is starting to be set. We'll just have to see if something takes advantage of it. All right, again, I'm out here in southeast Arizona in the Tucson area. Uh, I'm going to be heading today with my partner, Scott, to this area right here. That's Ruidoso. They have been hammered, plagued by flash flooding because of the burn scar. And they've got a pretty good risk today. So we're going to head into this direction as soon as I get this video online for you fine folks. And we're going to see if they get flooded again today. They had some flooding on the Rio Ruidoso yesterday. Uh, USGS has these cams that are out there. Uh, we have our cams too. So I'm going to take some of our technology and we'll see what happens. It's, you know, hit or miss. Uh, but Weather Service does say that Pretty widespread, in fact, let me click on it because I can show you. A pretty widespread threat of showers and thunderstorms today. Uh, this is their infographic. Scattered to numerous slow-moving storms will develop this afternoon. Storms will produce heavy downpours, increasing the risk of flash flooding on and below burn scars and the potential there for dangerous debris flows. And uh, some spotty amounts there, over two inches of rain, that will do it. So... We're going to head into that direction. So probably starting around, I'm just thinking here, noon our time, so 3 p.m. Eastern. It'll be in mountain time, though. I don't know, between 2 and 3 p.m. today. It's weird out here the way Arizona's in the Pacific time zone, and then it's whatever. Sometime between 2 and 3 o'clock today Eastern, Scott and I will be live on our YouTube. And uh, we did it yesterday over Starlink exclusively. And we were like 99% up. It was fantastic. We got in some pretty heavy rain with some hail aloft. And the ice just eats up, eats up that uh, spectrum, you know, talking to the satellite back and forth and you lose the signal. Nothing we can do about it. It's physics. But other than that, man, it worked great. No terrestrial network at all. Just using Starlink exclusively yesterday. And the stream was just terrific. Hoping for the same kind of luck today. And if Ruidoso does get some flooding... We will be there to cover it live. All right, so tune in later today and appreciate all the people that tuned in yesterday. And uh, we'll hope, hopefully see you again today.
So that's a look at the tropics as we close out the month of July. I'm trying to get my exit strategy ready for you here. I will come back tomorrow. Of course, it's August 1st. Got to do it. I like doing this. That's the other part. And we're going to look at uh, August climatology. I almost said July. We'll close out July. We'll look at August climatology, what to expect from a climatological perspective, and then we'll see what some of the modeling is starting to show as we get into that all-important month that usually heralds the beginning of a more active pattern across the deep tropical Atlantic. We shall see. All right, that is it from me for today. Thanks, as always, for tuning in. From all of us at Hurricane Track, good to have you. I'll see you in a few hours on the live YouTube from New Mexico.